and education as an explicit factor for the 10 rules that are used for successful nations. Now, some people will say, you know, how can you do that with education at one level appears such a fundamental rule for a, a successful nation? And my contention is that when I looked at economic data and I tried to see the relationship with economic growth, I found no relationship between education levels and the time horizon I'm interested in, which is three, five years in explaining which country is going to do well and not do well. In fact, education is likely a factor that plays uh, a role maybe over 40, 50 years in explaining how a nation does. And even then, there's a chicken egg factor. There's e enough economic evidence I found to suggest that uh, it is not that a nation becomes successful because of better education, but often successful nations are able to offer their citizens better education. Historically, everyone's looked at inflation in a very classic, uh, in a very classic way, which is focused on consumer price inflation, uh, the everyday kind of prices that we look at, uh, foods, vegetables, and other uh, items we buy. Whereas what I show in the book is that the modern menace of inflation is not consumer price inflation, but asset price inflation, which is that a lot of this easy money is not necessarily leading to higher inflation in the way we think about it, with the prices of goods and commodities going up, but more in terms of the prices of asset prices going up. Demographics is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for economic growth, which is that if you have good demographics, you can end up getting very high uh, economic growth. But only one in four countries historically has been able to convert that demographic advantage into high economic growth. And most of those countries were in East Asia. If you don't have a big increase in population growth rates, it's virtually impossible to achieve high economic growth rates that are defined as rates of more than 6% a year. The history of various leaders across the developing countries suggests that the maximum bang for the buck you get is when you elect a new leader, because typically a new leader enacts economic reforms in the first couple of years. And after that, you have diminishing returns to power. In fact, the longer a leader stays in power, the worst tend to be the stock market returns on a relative basis. Now, for countries in India's income class, which is a per capita income of less than $5,000, I think that a growth rate of anything above 5% should be considered a significant achievement because of these dynamics from depopulation to uh, deglobalization. So I think that the right benchmark for India's growth rate going forward is possibly 5%. And if India can grow at a rate of more than 5%, I would consider that to be a significant achievement. I've used this quote before, uh, you know, from my favorite movie, Top Gun, that I, uh, our ego keeps writing checks that our body can't cash, which is that uh, all the uh, economic experts in India want a massive stimulus. They want a stimulus and they keep referring to US and UK or even Germany. And the fact of the matter is that those countries uh, are in a very different spot because they have their own reserve currency or they have a currency that people have uh, you know, still faith in. And the fact is that we went into this crisis with very high public debt levels, at least for a developing country. So we just don't have the capacity to enact a massive stimulus. I've created this index of good and bad billionaires, where I say that the good billionaires are those which are largely creating their wealth on their own uh, through innovation in sectors such as manufacturing or technology, but it's really about what the firm or the business is doing. And the bad billionaires typically come in industries that require a lot of government help, of gaming regulations, the so-called rent-seeking industries, as economists put it. Now, not every billionaire in those industries, such as commodities and real estate, that are broadly defined as bad, is a bad billionaire. And not every good billionaire in technology and manufacturing is a purist. That a lot of the wealth creation in, uh, of late 
in sectors that are doing well in India, uh, such as the ones which are online, the virtual economy, a lot of that wealth creation is in fact happening overseas because the uh, unicorns in India are so hugely funded by uh, Chinese, Japanese, and of course, US investors that not too much wealth creation itself is happening in India. And that to me is also a bit of a uh, worrying sign that we are in this new era of tech colonialism where a lot of this virtual economy wealth is being created outside. There were a very large number of good quality companies that you could invest in India, almost regardless of how the macroeconomic cycle was playing out. This was for me one of the defining features of India, especially compared to other developing countries. You know, we had some very good quality companies uh, that that we could invest in. Over the last few years, that number has shrunk considerably. A lot of the uh, companies have either faced uh, their own issues because they had too much leverage. But I think that this concentration of wealth has also played a very big role there. That a lot of the new economy that has been created in, like in India, as you know, a lot of that wealth, again, as you point out, has really been created by one entity, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, under reliance. Uh, but you have not seen too many new companies emerge in India outside of the unicorns. I think what this pandemic has done has accelerated some of the trends that were already in play before this uh, crisis broke out. And those trends included deglobalization, included digitization. Those trends got mainly accelerated by this pandemic. I think that in the very short term, because of uh, uh, the uh, US election looming so large, rise in volatility before uh, a US election, that, that markets could remain volatile. But I think that until interest rates start rising again, which may happen if inflation comes back sooner than what people think, asset prices across the world will remain inflated or above what we used to think is fair value.